Hello, the internet. Hello, the world. Hello, people who are interested in direct democracy. The challenge I've set myself is to do this in 15 minutes, and it's going to be tricky. Uh, but let's start off with the idea, the very, very simple idea that a democracy is a system of government predicated on popular sovereignty. Well, what does that mean? Well, I think that is laid bare in this particular exchange between Richard Dawkins and Philip Hammond. Uh, system of government predicated on popular sovereignty, then should not the British people be the people who are talking about or who are going to make a decision uh, on Europe? Well, says Dawkins, that's far too complicated uh, for people to understand. And um, well, says Hammond, uh, that's too important. Well, it's a, that's a that's a damning incitement to the British people. Well, no, actually, says Dawkins, what we've got is representative democracy. We've got representatives who are there to make our uh, decisions on our behalf. We elect our politicians to make these decisions, to worry about these things so that we don't half have to. To which the Foreign Secretary responded, basically, fair enough, but at the last democratic election, we voted for a party who had a manifesto commitment to, uh, to have that referendum, and so therefore, it is a democratically valid exercise. I love that little exchange. It was quoted in Prospect in February in 2016, and it's a very good manifestation, a very good summary, really, of how democracy works in the UK. So let's look a little bit at, uh, at these two different notions of democracy. We've got direct, we've got representative. Now, we said that the people are the popular sovereigns, and there they are. But then we have to make a decision on a particular subject. And the question is, well, how do we make that decision? Well, representative democracy says <clears throat> that the people's elected representatives, that's them, basically make a decision on our behalf. Direct democracy says, no, actually, the people should make that decision, and then um, we work it out from there. And then we basically give that decision to our elected representatives to uh, implement for us. So anyway, it's all about who is making the decision, who is uh, responsible for deciding what we are going to do. Is it the people directly, or is it the representatives of those people? So what is direct democracy? Uh, that is cut and pasted from the Marx scheme, just learn it. Uh, we need to contrast that with representative democracy, that is the idea that decisions are made on behalf of the people by elected representatives, and remember that the key thing there is to distinguish between uh, representative, uh, sorry, uh, delegate, uh, delegate models and uh, Burkean representation, uh, which is all in a different presentation. Anyway, let's come back to uh, elected, uh, sorry, to uh, direct democracy, because we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about direct democracy, and we've got two types we need to worry about. We've got the Athenian model, uh, which is when all decisions are made by all of the people sitting there, and we've got the contemporary model, which is characterized by occasional sporadic involvement uh, of the people. Again, this is pretty much cut and pasted from the, uh, from, from the Marx scheme, so you just have to learn it. The examples that you need to know about in this particular exam are referendums and e-democracy and perhaps the notion of consultative democracy, but let's look at those in practice. So e-petitions, you know all about those, there's a handout associated with that, I don't really see the need to talk about it too much. Uh, if you want more detail, well this link here is a great one, uh, so go and follow it. Uh, other uh, <coughs> early, uh, other, what's it do? can't remember, never mind. Uh, but then we've got the idea of consultative democracy, that is policy forums and focus groups where the decision is made in consultation uh, with people. Uh, big society, big conversation. We talked about this when we were looking at pressure groups. The other really important thing to think about here in terms of direct democracy in action is recall. And again, I don't really want to go on about that too much. We don't have a meaningful system of recall in the United Kingdom. It's very, very clear. This is a poor version of recall that we have implemented. But again, that's something we can discuss in more detail at another time. Because really, what I want to talk about in this particular presentation are referendums. Now, referendums and sovereignty, this is important. We have, obviously, um, political sovereigns, policy sovereigns, and legal sovereigns. So the government decides if there's going to be a referendum. So the government is making a decision. It is therefore implementing policy sovereignty. That decision is then passed to Parliament, who passes the law describing that referendum. There we have a manifestation of legal sovereignty. The people then make the decision. So what we've seen here is a transfer of policy sovereignty to the political sovereigns. So the people make that decision. This is a rare example of policy sovereignty as uh, enjoyed by the people, who traditionally are simply the political sovereigns, that is, the source of all political authority. 
The government then decides how to implement that decision, and again, they are re retaking policy sovereignty, and then that is passed to Parliament to implement through legislation. So again, that is legal sovereignty being demonstrated. So here, this is the the, 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 the sovereignty tango. It's all in three times. We've got policy sovereignty, legal sovereignty, and political sovereignty, and it's being shunted around, or certainly policy sovereignty is being shunted around. The, uh, the parliament retains legal sovereignty. That does not change. Have a look at that. Make sure you're happy with that and bring me the questions in class. Now, really, the best way of looking at this is to consider the various referendums that we've had in the UK. So in the UK, all of the referendums are described by PEPERA, that is the Political Parties, Elections and Referendum Act of 2000. Uh, that established an electoral commission that's charged with running referendums and indeed elections, funnily enough. And this is what we call a quango, which is a quasi-autonomous non-governmental organization. That means it's run at arm's length from government. It's not technically part of government, but it is kind of answerable to government. Again, above and beyond the curriculum as far as you're concerned. Referendums are established by the Act of, by an Act of Parliament. So again, we've got the decision to have a referendum, that is policy sovereignty, then turned into reality through an Act of Parliament, that is legal sovereignty. So both government and Parliament getting involved there. The exact wording of a referendum is specified in the bill, and this is important for later. Um, so Parliament decides exactly what the referendum is going to say. So for example, when we come to the referendum in uh, June, the actual wording could be significant. If, it, if the referendum says, do you want to stay in the UK, yes or no, that is a subtly different question from do you want to leave the EU, yes or no. And that is going to be written into the bill. The actual wording is decided by Parliament, which means the actual wording is really decided by government. Um, but again, we'll uh, park that for the time being and come back to it. The Electoral Commission considers the wording, but again, it's really down to government uh, exactly what the question is going to be. Um, and before the Blair administration, we hadn't really been big on referendums in the UK. Uh, after Blair, however, we things have gone a little bit mental. So these are where we are so far, all the way up to Scotland in 2014. Now, the key thing here, I think, to look at is this number. If we look at the Scottish referendum turnout, that was 85%, uh, which is pretty damn impressive, particularly when we look at these other figures here. Um, so uh, Northern Ireland, the turnout was actually pretty high. It was pretty high there. It was 21%, uh, sorry, 81%. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, you can run through all of those yourself. Probably the single most important one here is this one, funnily enough. And the reason why it's important is because on this occasion, the government got an ex the answer it was not expecting. They were not expecting this massive no vote. And you'll see that generally speaking, it's the yes side uh, that wins out. That's because government very rarely will ask a question to which it doesn't already know the answer. Uh, which is why the Scottish independence one was very, very interesting, because that was in the balance right to the very end. One of the problems we look, we see when we come to look, when we come to assess referendums, is that because the government is so influential in the process, in the timing, in the constituency, in the actual wording of the process, in the wording of the question, sorry, very, very rarely will they not be able to engineer a particular outcome, the outcome being the one that they want. So that's one of the problems with the referendum. Again, we'll part of that for the time being, and we'll look at that when we come to analyze it. Pending UK referendums, of course, there's just the one. Uh, that is the EU referendum in or out. And uh, this is a hot link. So if you uh, want to see more uh, on this particular issue, then uh, you can go straight to this page here, the UK's referendum, all you need to know. And it truly is all you need to know. There's a stack on that. Uh, I suppose the only other thing that you need to know is that you have to answer yes. Uh, if you do anything else, you're insane. Uh, so yes, by the way, meaning we should stay in the Euro, <laughs> e EU rather than leave it. Uh, but that is a conversation for another day. So arguments for the referendums. Well, it's a pure form of democracy and it can provide consent for government action. Remember that generally government only has derived authority here. We can have direct authority for a particular decision. It also encourages political participation. Well, that's what the form book says, that's what the textbook says. In reality, if political participation in referendums is sub 50%, then it's not really working. But again, this is the technical answer, and it's one they want to come out. 
It encourages political awareness, blah, 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 blah. It can be used to be overcome, it can be used to overcome obstacles. And that's particularly true in Northern Ireland. Uh, the peace process in Northern Ireland was very, very divisive. Uh, but having that referendum meant that basically all sides had to shut up uh, once that decision was made and accept the outcome. And it can be used to supply closure on divisive issues. Now, this is not entirely unrelated to that particular issue. But with the EU, the idea is that this referendum in June is going to provide a definitive answer one way or the other, maybe resolve this for a generation. That was a theory in Scotland, of course, uh, but that uh, still hasn't quite uh, worked out the way it was supposed to. Anyway, uh, problems with, uh, problems with uh, referendum, and they are many. <clears throat> it is inconsistent with the notion of representative democracy. That was the point that Dawkins was making way back at the start of this presentation, and I don't think it's uh, possible really to challenge that one. There were rarely performed, uh, rarely proposed on issues where the outcome is uncertain. Uh, that generally was the idea. You must remember that Cameron was basically bullied into this EU referendum uh, by his party. He would much rather have not had this referendum, but he has, uh, he's kind of been bullied into it. Um, generally, it's all about government power, as I've said. On this occasion, because government is so divided, it doesn't know really what the answer it is that it wants. Uh, but the timing is at the discretion, the wording is at the discretion, and that allows them to come up with these loaded questions like this one that was asked in Australia uh, in 1999. Uh, again, another loaded question there with the electoral reform issue in 2011, uh, where we were presented with AV uh, plus, which is just about the worst form of uh, electoral system out there. Uh, some issues, as uh, Dawkins suggested, uh, were too complicated for the public. The public is not sufficiently well informed to answer that question. And it does open out the question of the tyranny of the majority, um, the tyranny of the voting majority, and if turnouts consistently low, that could be a real problem. Um, that's about it, really, with referendums. I've gone through that incredibly quickly. I'm sure there's going to be more questions out there. Uh, do bring them to me, and I'll answer them as best I can. Um, it only really remains to look very briefly at e-petitions. This is how the e-petition system works. Um, that's uh, obviously a little more detail on that. And here we have some exceptions uh, to the e-petition general rule. Uh, the the uh, marijuana debate did obviously happen. And uh, yeah, sorry, look at that. Um, the marijuana debate did happen. And uh, obviously, as with all e-petitions, or as with most e-petitions, nothing happened. And that's about it. Um, I look forward to questions. There must be lots. You can't really effectively do uh, direct democracy in 13 minutes. But I've had a go. Uh, do come to me with your questions and I'll speak to you then. All the best. Bye now.